Welcome to Sapientia. This is our first episode. Hello. Welcome. Glad you could make it. <laughs> uh, for Our topic for the first episode is climate change. Where do we go from here? Well, and it's interesting that we've gone anywhere. So it has been remarkably hot the last two days. Um, humidity about the same as the temperature. It's been, what was it, 95 high yesterday? Yeah. And uh, it's... I think it's like high 80s right now yeah and uh it's looking like it's threatening thunderstorms near us so we're hoping the rain cools us down but that's why i've got the got the got the short sleeves on got a you know well i guess when trump asked where that global warming was i guess we found it so <laughs> here it is like you can you can come up here in maine and you'll find it so that's good yeah for context uh maine doesn't usually get nearly this high and it certainly doesn't get this humid this is pretty pretty new weather for us yeah we uh i mean i remember as a kid we got a couple of days that were like over 100 degrees in like the end of august but that was about it like it didn't it didn't get into the 90s in july and then stay yeah certainly um so first thing is and and just to kick this off this this episode is not going to be talking about if climate change is happening uh there's a bunch of reports on it uh, from the um, IPCC and the WMO, if you really want to dig into this, we'll leave a couple of sources in the description, but for the most part, it's happening. It's a question about what we do about it. Yeah, so so for anybody who's looking for one of us to deny it, like, uh, th uh, there's the exit button for the window. You can just click it and, you know, go on your way. You'll be fine. So... It's uh, important to say that the what makes climate change so ethically interesting is that it consumes all of us and it has some pretty catastrophic effects. Uh, rising sea levels cause uh, re remarkable amounts of flooding. We have ice sheets that are melting. We have increased temperatures. And uh, probably the worst of it is just unpredictable weather patterns in, well, Maine and elsewhere. Yeah, and... Um... So a lot of this too, you know, it, it culminates into, like you said, global issues. So we're not looking at, you know, people think about, you know, individual climate areas changing and they get very hung up on, you know, the individual micro causa of, you know, oh, well, you know, the sea level is rising here and it's creating this issue and, you know, and it, they all play together. Um, and so... Uh, there's a, there's a book uh, by Timothy Morton called Hyperobjects, and he gets into this a little bit actually, and he defines a hyperobject as you know something that you really can never fully get the like the wholeness of. So every time you perceive some part of it, there's always some other part of it, and so it's always within reach, but always just out of grasp. Um, the specific language that he uses is that hyperobjects are objects that are massive with respect to space and time relative to humans. Global warming counts as one of these because it takes place over centuries and consumes the ecological activities of uh, generations of people such that the computational power you need to even compute and understand global warming um, in any particular moment is probably outpaced by the actual pace of the data that's coming in. Right. And so, of course, this creates a lot of issues of, you know, where do we start? Um, you know, like I mentioned, with all the, you know, individual little microcosm and things like that, where small climate areas are changing a lot, um, you know, it's important to address do we try to solve the individual little issues? Do we try to wrap them up into a big issue and try to take care of that in some meaningful way? Um, I'm personally a, a big fan of, you know, trying to do larger scale things, um, though I know the UN has tried to do that to some degree and mm -hmm. with varying almost minimal success because... The individual company or not companies, uh, countries in question often don't like being sort of uh, policed by the UN as sort of the you know 
we're the master of ethics and if you don't like it <laughs> then you can get out um well, companies too to be honest oh yeah um, certainly we should we should state two things about that um about the things that the un has tried to do so there's been two major agreements so to speak in the un although as we've said there are certainly non-compliant countries uh the kyoto protocol and the paris agreement um kyoto protocol happened in i think the mid 90s yeah. and it tried to find a way it was based on the polluter pays model which we'll get into um which is essentially everyone has a certain amount of emissions that they're capable of having as individuals you distribute that across a population of a country and that's their emissions quota the, the interesting thing about the Kyoto Protocol was it established something called emissions trading, which is where a country who has a low quota relative to the amount that they would need to output could trade in the emissions quota of another country, essentially giving them money for their ability to output greenhouse gases. What this meant was India might has a huge population. They don't emit very much. So the U.S. could pay them some sum of money based on the uh, valuation of the carbon that they would emit and while India gets that sum of money we're allowed to output that carbon now obviously we didn't do this because <laughs> well, uh, we're uh, I, I think it's partly the uh, the American psyche of just not like being pushed around um, despite being the global police we don't like being pushed around so um, I, it doesn't that doesn't make a lot of sense to me but I think it's also partly just the the amount of industry that relies on on carbon emissions mm -hmm. in this country. So why would we follow it if it doesn't really have any any tangible gain for us? Um, which of course is a, a huge issue. Yeah. So the second one was the Paris Agreement, and unlike the Kyoto Protocol, the Paris Agreement didn't establish specific benchmarks that countries need to hit. So unlike the Kyoto Protocol, um, which had a cap on the emissions that you could emit, so, so it applied a number to the country, the Paris Agreement allowed countries to define their own goals, and the only requirement of those goals was that they have to be highly ambitious. So the point was that you try to set it as high as possible and do everything you can to reach that with the understanding that you might not. The Paris Agreement has a, that huge advantage. So c countries that didn't want to be compliant could s just define their own goals and try to uh, negotiate with the other countries about what they believe there should be. So the U.S. might actually have a higher emissions per capita than India, but that's with the recognition that the, you know, the industry in the U.S. is very different. Right. Of course, we've recently pulled out of that, and uh, well, who knows where that's going now? Yeah. Well, and it's. Um... It's it's interesting too. So with a with an agreement like that, where it's just you know, hey, go and do your best, and <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, make an effort. There's um, there's the really easy tendency to just say, uh, well, anybody that you know knows anything about uh, psychiatry or psychology knows that people or groups of people who are not already self motivating will not motivate themselves mm -hmm. to do something, even if they are threatened by it um and especially in a in a case like climate change where for a lot of people the threat is not uh concrete yet it's not a tangible thing you know you look around and you say oh well you know we had more tornadoes this year or we had more high category hurricanes or you know typhoons or whatever like that but it's not it hasn't really reached a tangible level yet we're not or some people are not seeing the 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 causal linkages the things are not increasing in intensity at a rate or what have you that really causes alarm right and the the, the gradualness of hyper objects is part of why they're so damning right <laughs> you, you just yeah you you see the you know we we mentally adapt to every little change that gets made because it's what we do uh but uh, we don't really realize that the changes that are being made are being made to an end that is you know potentially catastrophic i think i think there's a good amount we can do to avoid catastrophe um yeah, let's hope <laughs> well yeah i'd certainly i i would i i agree that there is a certain amount of damage that we have done that can't be undone 
Um, though I would be interested to see, you know, we get our act together on this a little bit mm -hmm. and see, you know, can we get things back to where, you know, the planet can naturally begin to regulate things again. Um, so we should uh, get into some of these ethical frameworks because as you can see between the Kyoto Protocol and the Paris Agreement, there is a somewhat of a paradigm shift. Whereas unlike the Kyoto Protocol where it's just trying to apply some universalizable standard, uh, the, the Paris Agreement now doesn't uh, now allows countries to have this kind of uh, almost multicultural way of going about it. So um, one of the earliest ethical theories about how to deal with climate change hinged upon already existing ideas about justice and ethics. Um, so this model was called the polluters pays model and it's really, really intuitive. As Peter Singer puts it, it's essentially, if you had caused a problem, you ought to fix it. And it's really important to say that this isn't a punishment, but rather it's taking responsibility. So a good way to think about it is, imagine you had a like a sink in your village and you just poured all of your shit in the sink. Oh, are we allowed to swear? Oh well. <laughs> <laughs> It'll be fine. Wait, we've done it. Um, we're we're twenty something dudes talking about philosophy. Monetization isn't really something we're worried about. <laughs> So you're pouring all your stuff in the sink, all your trash in the sink, and you think it's endless, but eventually you find out that it's not. So absent of other concerns, you'd think that it relies on the whole village to clean this up. But imagine that you have one person in your village who had been dumping way more trash than everyone else. It seems reasonable, despite their ignorance, that they would have to take responsibility of cleaning up their mess. So this is the polluters pay model. We know that there is a set of countries that have polluted more than other countries, and given that, they are responsible for cleaning this up. So, what do you think about that, James? Um, I, I, do, I do agree to some extent that the, the perpetrator should be the one that ultimately takes responsibility for the perpetration of whatever it is. Um, and that, I think people would be inclined to agree with with any crime um any any just law that constitutes a punishment the person perpetuating the action is the one responsible for it so on that level i agree um i think that we have to be careful that we don't get into the sort of really deep postmodern idea of the polluters are the you know the the evil people and we the people who are just trying to live our daily lives are somehow victimized by that yeah and this actually really gets at the hyper objectsness of global warming um it's, it's not something that you can localize in sets of individuals really um the average american who's driving their car isn't actively trying to contribute to global warming they're just trying to get to work right and the fact that they have to drive an automobile that emits carbon is not entirely up to them um in, in short, if you need transportation to get to work, and the only transportation options that are available to you are ones that emit carbon, then you don't really have a choice in the matter. And so reducing it to these individuals doesn't seem like a reasonable thing to do. And this applies also to industries and perhaps even entire nations. Oh, yeah, I totally agree. Um, the, the mindset that one person is going to make a huge impact in the climate change phenomenon is absolutely absurd. Um, and I, I appreciate the, the animus behind something like that. You know, it's, hey, this thing that seems to be out of control is seemingly even more out of control. So, you know, why, how about you, the individual, you know, do something like ban plastic straws, <laughs> though that's a whole other issue, which has its own ramifications. But, you know, why don't you take the bus? You know, why don't you take a train? And it's like, well, okay, you can do that. So you get on a bus and you weigh it down more, which means you're the engine in the bus, which is probably burning diesel, which isn't quite as clean as petrol in a lot of cases. Um, it has to burn more because you just got on the bus. Uh, so is your overall impact on the environment actually lessened by using public transportation versus using your own car? Right. Um, 
in which the the efficiency of that vehicle is specifically inclined to having one or two passengers, whereas something as large as a bus will actually you you feel the weight of it. That's why you pay extra for you know extra baggage or whatever on airliners because it uses more fuel. So uh, you weigh down the plane more, you pay more to be on it because you know that's. I guess sort of a, a way of viewing the polluter pays model. Maybe not. Well, interestingly, this gets us to our first objection to the polluter pays models. We'll leave a link to, well, at least a reference to Simon Canny's paper on. Well, let's see if I can find the name of that thing. Anyway, yeah, I don't remember that off the top of my head. There's a paper by Simon Cannon we'll leave in the description where he lays, lays out a bunch of objections to the polluter's pay model. And the first one is the, uh, is this an Sorry. I have to cut that out. Oh, uh, yeah, I can, I can cut it. Where did you? Okay. I think it was the ignorance, ignorance problem. Ignorance problem? Okay. Yeah. Well, the first problem was the uh, the ignorance problem. So essentially that there are people who are ignorant of the consequences of them or unable to really deal with them. Right. Um, so if you think uh, this is just essentially, you think back to like before 1990, uh, people weren't really aware of the consequences of their actions, and then now we have this system that's perpetuating emissions that people really can't be held responsible for in quite this uh, robust way. Right, yeah. Um, so another great example of this is, um, you know, any any large change that's happened in a society. So you move from, say, say Constantine adopting, you know, Christianity— um, so uh, certainly there were lots of people who said, um, you know, what are you doing? Why are you suddenly imposed? Like, why is this a big deal all of a sudden? I mean, it certainly wasn't all of a sudden. There was, you know, lots of apostasy going on from Judaism and certainly from Roman paganism at the time. But, and that's, I think that's mirrored in the same way that there were a lot of people who are already conscientious about these climate change phenomena that, you know, even back in the, what, 60s, 70s, that were like, hey, we think that something might go wrong if we continue to do these things. And everybody said, okay, well, let's study it. Um, and that has kind of been the back and forth between people who have been worried about it and people who have been skeptical about it, basically, mm -hmm. um, of something might happen okay let's see what happens in a shorter term and then maybe we can fix it in the long term um i think that to some degree that's continued to happen um that we continue to be skeptical about it um and certainly it's not a bad thing to be skeptical um but in this case we have taken our skepticism a little bit too far and turn it into basically what sloth about the <laughs> yeah. entire issue that yeah, you know, we've seen this big thing, uh, and we've seen it progress very slowly, of course, more rapidly lately, um, or seemingly so, and so it's it's lost its attention. Like, it was a big deal when, you know, it was first being noticed that, hey, the climate is changing in ways that are not something that we've seen before. Uh, and everybody said, oh, well, that could be a problem, so let's do something about it. And not a whole lot was done about it. And, you know, people use reusable bags, and they recycle, and, you know, Bangor's got a nice recycling program, mm -hmm. which is apparently changing, again, um, to be even nicer, I'm told, uh, by the city. So I hope they're right. Uh, and, you know, we recycle our cans and bottles. We, you know, try to carpool with people when we go to work and things like that. Um, and, you know, we start doing these things and then we do them subconsciously or unconsciously, as it were. Uh, and then we stop caring about it. We say, oh, well, I've recycled, I've carpooled, yeah, yeah. I've, you know, used uh, higher ethanol, I use biodiesel or whatever. And so I'm just, you know, I'm, I'm off the hook. You know, I'm, I'm doing what I can do. Um, and 
thank you for all of the people who do recycle and do those kinds of things. Thank you. That does help. Um, but don't let it be your unconsciousness feeding you through that, that you suddenly become blind to all of the other issues that are taking place that, uh, sure, the individual might not have the responsibility uh, because they didn't necessarily perpetrate it, but we certainly have some level of individual responsibility for not making it worse, at least for ourselves. Um, while we're talking about global warming being a hyper object and being really spread over time and how ignorance goes back to before pre 1990s, there's another really interesting counter argument that Simon Canny proposes and he calls it the previous generation problem, or at least, uh, it's inspired by David Parfit's non-identity problem. So there's this going logic that even if the people alive today weren't the people who had emitted in the past that has led to the global warming crisis that we have now, they're still responsible for paying for it. Uh, there's two ways of looking at this. Either it's a collectivist notion, which means that collectives themselves are responsible for emissions, or you're switching your logic from a polluter pays model to a beneficiaries pays model, where the people who benefit from the emissions are the people who are responsible for doing something about it. Um, the essentially the non-identity issue is that, well, the people who are alive today are different people than people who would have been alive if there were not global warming. All right. This sounds really trite, but it's really important to lay this out. We think that they are made better off because of global warming, but this isn't quite true. You're comparing them to people who are non-existent. They can't be better off compared to non-existence. It's that they are merely existing because of this. Right. Yeah. Um, what was the... Oh, it escapes me now. Um, the the I guess that that I think has that direct tie to, um, you know, how we are thought of as being, you know, better off than our parents. Let's say so. Every generation, at least in this country, um, has thought to have amassed some more. Uh, wealth or earnings or somehow life has been improved in general mm -hmm. uh, over that of our parents and you know their parents and so forth and so forth um, and you know we've gotten to a point now where you know there's the thought that oh well maybe we aren't you know mm -hmm. maybe maybe we are different in some way um, and I think that that's kind of what we're doing right now in the climate. We've realized that something is going on, and even though we're not the ones who started it, now we've got to basically shoulder it up and say, okay, well, you know, just what the hell are we going to do about it? Precisely. Um, the, the, the Probably the most interesting piece is that, um, as you've kind of noted, uh, it doesn't, well, for one, we might not be benefiting from it. True. And uh, even even these emissions, like we can, we can get into a whole conversation about that, but... Um, you have to perform some kind of calculus to say that. Um, and you have to use some metrics, and people might disagree about what metrics you use. Um, but probably my most interesting part, too, is that um, well, if you were to use this sort of model, then it leaves out everything that these people aren't. So, for instance, um, Suppose that there was something, some thing in the 1930s that led to increased emissions that either were not benefiting from, or people, or they were, no, uh, w they were ignorant about it, so they're not, they can't be held responsible for it, or whatever other exclusionary thing you want to have. Um, in that particular instance, that emissions isn't captured by this model, and so essentially it would be in the void. We wouldn't deal with it. Right. Yeah, it's uh, it's almost like a quantum problem where you have you have two things that you're trying to assign us something specific to, and you can't you can't quite pin either one down at the same moment. Um, but I mean, the the emissions happened, um, and how you choose to assign responsibility for taking care of that is sort of arbitrary to the fact that oh well you know now there's you know. How many more parts per million CO2 in the atmosphere? Like a hot, it's some astronomical amount. It, it was fluctuating between 100 and 
80 to 210 parts per million for like the last you know 40,000 years or something like that and then just in the last you know 100 or so like basically since the industrial revolution started that's skyrocketed to like what 400 parts per million yeah. now in the atmosphere that sounds about right um i actually watched uh, a, an interesting little discussion about that this morning um how the the sort of natural consumption by the environment of co2 in the atmosphere was something like 370 or 380 gigatons mm -hmm. per year and so that system was in check because that's about how much the earth produces by uh you know natural processes um respiration things like that um and then humans by and large um with their consumption of various carbon-based fuels and whatever uh you know jump that number up by 35 gigatons on top of all of that other co2 emission and so we see an annual rise of something in the neighborhood of about 10 i think it's between like 10 and 15 gigatons mm -hmm. of co2 gets added to the atmosphere every year um so that's that's definitely an issue but but who do we blame for that you know we did i i haven't i haven't personally put 10 gigatons of yeah. co2 into the atmosphere i mean i breathe but uh, you know maybe we should just who was it that said maybe we should all just take a deep breath and then never exhale <laughs> uh, what was that uh, i don't know it sounds like david benatar oh my god <laughs> <laughs> yeah maybe that uh, sounds about right are we gonna become any natalists james um I, though well okay so you say that kind of in joke <laughs> oh here we go but um that is i think a one serious pin that people put on other people is the responsibility of having less children or responsibility i'll put in air quotes because i don't necessarily think that that's the way of going about it i don't i don't think that having less human beings on the planet necessarily equates to more efficient energy consumption because certainly the way we consume energy now is far more efficient than we did a hundred years ago we just consume more of it um mm -hmm. and you know i think it's important to recognize that it's not about having less people on the planet it's about having more people actively working towards efficiency uh in a way i agree although i do think that there is something to be said about um the amount i mean if your per capita uh emissions is you know let's say over their lifetime a couple hundred gigatons right like if you don't have that child you won't have that in the atmosphere although i agree with you it's certainly a short-term solution the fact of the matter is we have seven billion people on this planet going up to nine and there's not you not having children is not going to have any effect on that just like you uh, carpooling right <laughs> right and so yeah it's um it, it's kind of a red herring in a way that you know people like to like to poke poke issue with people that do not appear to take responsibility in the same way so you could have you know a person that is you know very very solidly antenatal um meaning they don't want you to have children for those who don't know what antenatalism is don't have babies that's the that's the idea it's a stronger basically. position actually it's not just that you shouldn't have children it's that you have a moral obligation to not produce new beings and some would even take this so far as to say that you can't have pets because you're creating a demand for uh, animals to come into existence. Of course, I, I don't think David Benatar would say that, but... No, um, and and my apologies for strawmanning <laughs> that a little bit. I think it I think it's a little bit absurd, and I have, I have a hard time <laughs> characterizing it sometimes. Where's strawman up here? Yeah, I don't know if you can see it in frame. Strawman's that one right there, right there above Slippery Slope. Uh, we've got this fallacy poster. Um, we're going to try not to commit any of these, though I think I may have inadvertently uh, uh, misstepped on the straw man bit. But, um, well, and it's interesting because you get these people that are like, oh, well, you know, having kids is bad for the environment, so don't do it. Um, or you have the person that, you know, has a really clean lifestyle, but has like five kids, let's say. Yeah. Just, I'm pulling some statistical person out of a hat, and they have five kids. Um, and they live in, let's say, uh, a net zero house. It's a zero emission house that's completely powered by, 
you know, wind, solar, geothermal, wood, whatever, anything that's neutral, mm -hmm. essentially. And, you know, the, the person who doesn't have kids, but, you know, smokes cigarettes and flicks their butts everywhere and, you know, drives this gigantic gas guzzling car, uh, will look at them and just say, oh, well, you had five kids, so you're making a terrible impact on the planet. <laughs> it's like, it's, it's, uh, I don't know if that one's up here in the language that I'm used to, but it's, uh, it's the too cool quay fallacy. Ah, too cool quay, right? There. Oh, yeah. Okay, sweet. So we've got that covered. Um, so yeah, like, you can do, if you, if you're doing something that's obviously bad, don't fall back on your, well, I'm doing this good thing. What are you doing? Um, and this actually gets at the part of the heart of the problem with the polluter pays model, because on the other hand, too, it's it only dissuades you from polluting. It doesn't say that polluting is necessarily moral wrong, so long as I pay for it, right? But if we have this model, it's not going to lead to necessarily reduced emissions, right? Um, so that oh, and. There's one final problem I definitely want to bring up about the polluters pays model, and it's it's a very interesting problem, I would say. Um, and this actually gets to some of the stuff you've been talking about. Uh, it doesn't seem reasonable if someone has been emitting a lot, either an individual or a collective, if they're especially poor, to place the burden of paying for their emissions on them, especially if they've done it in ignorance. So we're especially looking at uh, poorer countries like China and India. No, oh, yeah. Um, of course, their emissions are definitely lower than the U.S., but uh, and they definitely haven't surpassed their Kyoto Protocol quota, but even then, you still, there's still a need to clean it up, and it doesn't seem right for them to shoulder that burden. Right. You know, there's a, you know we could be consuming a lot more energy by... Uh, you know, through natural gas or whatever like that that still produces carbon, but, you know, in these poor places where they're not, they're not consuming as much energy, but the energy that they're consuming is through coal, mm -hmm. um, which, you know, you always heard the joke or the, the advertisements about, you know, investing in clean coal. There's no such thing as clean coal. It's all, it, coal is just dirty. It's, it's dirty. It's sooty. It has lots of sulfur. Um, especially you Canadians with your bituminous coal, please stop burning that. That puts so much damn sulfur in the atmosphere. Please stop. Oh, we're gonna have to. We're gonna have to have an episode about astroturf. Right? Oh yeah. Well, yeah, that has its own issues. <laughs> but well, so so where where do you say we improve on the um, on trying to keep keep people, even the poorer countries, responsible for? what they're doing but in a way that is beneficial to everyone right and so this gets that so simon canny provides a hybrid account one that he thinks takes into account these egalitarian problems the generational problems and condenses it into something that we can all more universally agree upon and doesn't place undue por burdens on uh, excusably ignorant persons or collectives and especially poor collectives or persons in the hybrid account, he is, is essentially laid out like this, and I'll, I'll read out to you the exact argument. A person has a right to X when X is a fundamental interest that is weighty enough to generate obligations on others. Persons have a fundamental interest to not suffer from death or crop failure, heat stroke, infectious diseases, flooding and destruction of their homes, and forced relocation, rapid, unpredictable, and dramatic changes in their natural and social and economic world, and so on. These are all consequences of global warming. Persons have a right not to suffer from the disadvantages generated by global ch climate change is thereby the conclusion. So all persons are under a duty not to, to emit greenhouse gases in excess of their quota. And now this, this is much stronger than the polluters pays. It's not just that you have to pay for cleaning up, but you actually have a moral obligation not to emit. This, I mean, seems self-evident and seems like the undertone of the polluter pays model, but it actually isn't. Then, from there, he says, those who exceed their quota have a duty to compensate others, like the polluters pays model, but, he, uh, as an addendum to this, in light of the previous generation's excusable ignorance and polluters who cannot be made to pay, the most advanced have a duty to either reduce their emissions in proportion with the harms resulting from these, or to address the ill effects of climate change resulting from those. So this is a really important point that um, 
there are submissions that we just can't work under any theory of ethics or uh, justice. But because of the way in which this problem is spread over time and space, someone has to do something about it. And so we should force those burdens on the people who are most capable of doing something about it. Right, I agree. And I think the um, I, whether it's uh, overt or slightly more discreet in his argumentation or solution to this problem that, um, you know, we take some arbitrary point in time, or maybe not arbitrary, maybe some calculated point in time, and we say, okay, so everything that happened from this point backwards, we're going to forget about all of those emissions, all of those things that happened, because there's no way of reasonably assigning somebody the responsibility of picking up after that. So from, you know, time X, you know, whether it's 1990 or 2000 or whatever, we're going to say, okay, well, everything that happened after this point, because we cared about it, everybody has to have some kind of responsibility or make up for what's going on. Right. Okay. Yeah. And that, I think that's huge, honestly, because it it does solve one of the problems, which is, you know, people arbitrarily fighting back and forth. Well, it's not my responsibility. You know, somebody before me did it. And it's like, exactly. okay, so let's draw a line. Let's agree to draw a line somewhere and say, okay, from this point forward, you had responsibility because either you knew what you were doing or you were around actually influencing the problem mm -hmm. and could have done something about it and didn't. Um, and he, he has a corollary to this at the very end. Um, one of the uh, another addendum that I think is r really useful to think about too. Um, in light of the polluters who cannot be made to pay, we all should also construct institutions that discourage future non-compliance and emissions. So, um, on top of that, it's not just that we should try to compensate or try to adapt, but also that we should construct our institutions in such a way that they can avoid some of the problems that we were laying out, where like I don't have an option in my transportation, so I have to do something that emits carbon. Well, I should make institutions that make it so that people do have a green option going right. forward. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it'd be interesting to see if uh, somebody could get their head around how to make a nuclear car. You know, <laughs> you, you go to you drive up to your depot and uh and you like inject a fuel reactor into your yeah engine. so you you drive up to your um your your gasless station <laughs> and um you, you get your little block of uh, uranium or plutonium or whatever and you stick it in your car and you know you react that for a while the russians would probably be all over that <laughs> i remember um just as i saw it and like i think the early 2000s they were trying to get a fusion car on the road it didn't go very far Ironically. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, both literally and figuratively, actually. Yeah. Well, and I think, it, um, I think it proves an interesting point, too. It's like the reason, like, uh, just as a, a little backstory on me, my original plan when I went to college was to study, um, like, nuclear engineering, basically. My plan was to go in the Navy and be, a, you know, a, a nuke, basically. So... Um, yeah, I don't know why they call them Navy nukes, but that's what we do. So uh, the idea was, you know, the reason that nuclear reactors work on submarines and, you know, large vessels and stuff like that is that they're sitting on water. They're sitting on their coolant system. Um, so unless you can basically take, you know, one of those big office water cooler jugs of water, put about five of those in the trunk of your car <laughs> to yeah. sit and, uh, you know, sink all of the heat that comes off of your reactor that doesn't get used up in propulsion. Okay, well, now you just weighed down your car by, you know, however many pounds that is, probably, you know, 300 pounds of water in the yeah. back of your car. Have you actually made it more efficient or are you just, you know, pumping out radiation everywhere? So now that we're uh, on the topic of nuclear, we should actually get into some of the uh, other scientific parts of this and how renewable energy factors into this. So um, the first stuff is well, now, we, now we have an ethical framework to work, work with and we know that we need to get away from this, uh, these, uh, these emissions regardless of how that looks and the most advantaged have a need to do this. So how do we do this practically? Well. Um, as it's been said by by a few a few notable names um, in various TED talks, um, um, Bjorn Longberg, uh, although we are aware of some of the controversies surrounding him, Michael Spellingberg, 
uh, Spellingberger, um, and well, Peter Singer himself, Simon Canny, a few others. Yeah, um, you know they make a they make a fairly strong case for not just saying, oh, we need to switch to all renewables like right away. It's we need to we need to innovate a way to produce the same amount of energy not only in a less emissive way but in a more efficient and less emissive way um so just as an example um that schellenberger talks about in one of his um one of his ted talks he's mentioning um a, a solar field so a big solar farm where they cover vast acreages in solar panels um, and so he talks about how it creates a couple of issues. It takes away the habitat of um, the specific one that he's talking about, a lot of uh, desert tortoises uh, and things like that. It also makes it hazardous for birds to fly over because it's basically a giant heat sink. So they, they fry and fall to the ground uh, dead, which is really sad um, that we don't. You know, where, how did Schellenberger say it? Are we sacrificing the environment for the climate? Was that the panels or the turbines? Uh, that was, so the so the panels were affecting the small birds. So the, the wind turbines, which I'm sure we'll get to shortly, um, the wind turbines were affecting the, the larger birds. Um, oh, and bats, right? Yeah, and bats. So an entire species of bats in... I think it was the Northwest were like basically pushed to the verge of extinction uh, just because of wind turbines. So they just fly into them, um, which is really sad because we don't want, we're trying to fix the climate so that things don't go extinct. And it seems like we might inadvertently be putting things at risk of extinction trying to save the climate and sacrificing the environment. <laughs> and I should mention, too, by the way, when um, they were talking about the um, desert tortoises as they related to the, the solar farms and stuff like that, um, they took the tortoises into uh, sort of captivity um, to help them sort of adjust to having lost their natural habitat, and um, almost all of them died as a result. Um whether they were, you know, aged or, you know, slightly younger and more able to adapt, even they were not completely capable of actually shouldering the, um, the, the burdens, as, you, as it were, of, uh, of relocating. So I think it's a really, a really good point that we have to be careful uh, how zealous we are about renewables and that that zeal does not turn into blind faith in if we just build one more solar panel if we just you know ban one more kind of emission uh, you know everything will be solved i think that is incredibly short-sighted on the on the part of the practitioners and i think it really misses the whole point you know if we uh what what was it uh the maze runner movie that starts out with the uh the the big shot of like uh 2049 or oh, yeah. whatever like the, and solar it, panels everywhere yeah there's just like this huge field of solar panels and it's desolate there's no birds there's no anything for like the entire frame is taken up by these solar farms and there's nothing else around it and you might say oh well that's super dystopian and it's like but is it is it really that dystopian are we are too many of us actually thinking that we need to go in that direction without thinking about what's already there. Um, there's a quote I'd like to read from Hyperobjects that, I, that really uh, awakened me to the, some of these concerns. Uh, Utilitarianism is deeply flawed when it comes to working with hyperobjects. The simple reason why is that hyperobjects are profoundly futural. No self-interested theory of ethical action whatsoever, no matter how extended or modified, is going to work when it comes to objects that last for hundreds of thousands of years. There's a radical asymmetry between the urgency and the passion and the horror we feel when we are confronted with hyper objects. Doing nothing is evident, evidently wrong. If we drive a Prius, um, that doesn't do anything. But it won't solve the problem in the long run. Sit around criticizing Prius drivers, well, that won't help at all either. Form a people's army and seize control of the state, Will the new society have the time and resources to tackle global warming? 
Solar panels, they take up a lot of energy, they take a lot of energy to make. Nuclear power, Fukushima and Chernobyl. Stop burning fossil fuels right now. Are we ready for such a colossal transition? Every position is wrong. Every position, including the especially and especially the know-it-all cynicism that thinks it knows better than anyone else. So what essentially this means is that there's going to be ecological impacts, there's going to be consequences in anything that we do, and ultimately we just have to trudge forward and make a choice and tr try to work with the data that we have as it's coming in. Uh, just going gung-ho with renewables probably isn't the solution, and also just trying to stay with our oil isn't the solution either. The, ultimately, we'll need a multi-pronged approach, and we'll have to just accept things as they come and try to work through what we have. Yeah, and I think it's, um, you know, it's interesting, too, to think about uh, the, the levels in which we deal with these things. So I think it's really easy um, in our sort of postmodern mindset that so many people have found themselves in, whether by choice or by force. I say force, I mean sort of like undercover not so obvious mental coercion into a new way of thinking that has arisen lately is that our situation has become so vast so dire so you know unchangeable that people just say you know the hell with it i'm not going to do anything about it because either i as the individual can't do anything about it or we've already done so much that it doesn't even seem worth our while to worry or consider what might happen next um you know presumably a majority of the people that are you know 20 something are going to be 60 something at some point and you know in 40 years time i'd like to have some place to live uh <laughs> you know, not just because i have a job or whatever but there's actually a physical place where i can manifest my being that isn't you know either scorched or deforested or you know arid basically yeah and it's important to note that uh, as timothy morton points out every position is wrong even the one where you do nothing the thing is is that utilitarianism uh there's so many different ways you can slice it that if you depending on the perspective or the time slice that you pick uh a position could be right or wrong and that's what makes it so difficult to deal with so in short we should use renewables, but that shouldn't be our, our only solution. And we shouldn't be just trying to build tons of solar panels, expecting that that's going to fix it. Right. Yeah. And so that kind of, I think, will will naturally lead into uh, our, uh, you know, looking for looking for other venues for energy. Um, certainly, I like I'm a big fan of nuclear. Um, mm -hmm. Though I think before we get into that, not a not a sponsorship or anything, but we've got we've got some uh, we've got some Death Wish coffee here. It's the uh, Valhalla Java Odin Force blend that uh, Zach Wild, uh, my uh, my beloved uh, Black Label Society guitarist, came up with. And uh, you know, not a not a plug or anything, but like the the coffee maker doesn't have a name. Uh, we want this coffee maker. Um, you know, as, as philosophers, we, we need our coffee maker to be our mascot for this whole endeavor. Um, and, and we hope you guys are on board with it. Uh, it needs a name. So it had, it had a name and, um, yeah, I'm sure Freud would be really happy about it. <laughs> um, Freud, so it had a name, right? And, um, long story short, I got close to it with a uh, pocket knife and so it doesn't have a name anymore. For legal reasons. Uh, right. Um, also, that's a joke for legal reasons. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, so we need a name for it. So I haven't, I haven't thought of anything. Uh, I don't know if you've given it much thought. No. Uh, what I, I think that this should be this. This is for all of us. Uh, you, if you guys have a good name for our coffee maker, for our mascot, give us a give us a comment. Yeah. So uh, the the only thing that had popped into my brain and. Uh, uh, this was like yesterday, like yesterday evening. I was thinking of this. I was like, "What if we called it Coffee Antia?" Coffee Antia. Um, I I think that might be a little ahead of its time, but we also want to leave it to you guys. So you know, give us an idea. We got to refill on the coffee, but uh, before we start talking about nuclear and just uh, for edification, no, this isn't a nuclear powered uh, coffee maker or anything yeah, like we're, that. Yeah, we're we're filthy. We're emitting right now, uh, but you know, but that's life. 
Yeah, you know, our... I, I We should just take a deep breath and not exhale. David yeah. Benatar for you folks. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, it's it's important, too, to recognize, like, the uh, just as an aside from that, like, the idea that you can just stop emitting somehow, like, and, you know, as Morton points out in that quote, like, you can't just stop emitting. This, this is not how it works. Like, something has to get emitted somewhere. Um, you know, we can't just you know suddenly unplug and lose our coffee and say you know all green yeah because um, losing our coffee would really be a, a travesty right I don't, I don't think i could live without it right and you know this isn't like an aa plug or anything like that um <laughs> and i don't have a coffee problem either uh i don't it's really um so there's this fallacy right here which i think is probably out of focus i'll try to zoom it in um so it's it's the appeal to nature so a lot of the a lot of the support for the you know let's just stop emitting let's go all green let's go all renewable really quickly comes down to the naturalistic fallacy or the appeal to nature uh that basically says if we try to just align ourselves with nature if we try to harmonize ourselves to use the the new coin term for it though i don't think it's harmony uh that everything will be okay that we'll somehow solve all of our problems by harmonizing with nature and you know going all green um thoughts on that oh well absolutely not uh again you're just missing the fact that we we it's really hard to wrap your head around this but hyper objects are both viscous and non-local you are always and everywhere inside of them it, it's you're inextricably linked to them in such a way that you are always affecting them but the second thing is that it's non-local you know the, uh, we made a plug about the weather here this morning but really the weather here isn't global warming the weather anywhere isn't global warming the climate anywhere on earth isn't global warming it's all of that and then some right so the idea that you can just like harmonize with it is, is it's it's absurd uh, you're gonna have we're gonna, our society is going to have an impact and the question is how do we minimize that impact or make that impact beneficial right and so great place for nuclear um for anybody that has doubts about its safety its efficacy um anything like that we hope that you won't tune out for this because you know i i I, I read research papers about nuclear reactors, and you have to sit and listen to this because <laughs> he spent it, a lot of time on this. If I have to read one more account of the mechanical properties of concrete after radiation, uh, I'm not gonna do it. So listen this time because <laughs> I'm not gonna repeat myself. Um, so in the the quote from hyperobjects when you know morton very quickly glazes over a lot of things and one of the things he glazes over is nuclear um and you know mentions fukushima and um, chernobyl so we think about them as being really bad mm -hmm. and we think about them as being catastrophic but but they weren't like not really so they they were not as globally impactful as you know throwing plastic in the ocean or you know burning lots of coal like those things will affect everyone a nuclear reactor failing in ways that were compounded you know failures on top of failures that were never even thought could happen um though building a reactor where you can get a tsunami is kind of beyond me um <laughs> yeah. but uh, you know island life i guess um yeah it's it's hard to just discredit the entirety of, of what nuclear tries to accomplish in producing energy by just looking at you know two cases or three mile island which again was a you know basically a pr incident more than it was an actual reaction failure so it's uh, important to talk about the numbers here um in all three of those accidents uh, only around 10 people died in each one, which, I mean, is a travesty. It's a tragedy. 10 people died. But if you compare that to the worst accidents in oil and coal, yeah. it's, in, it's, it's orders of magnitude less. Thousands of people die in coal every year. Uh, hundreds of people die on uh, oil rigs. And 
the Gulf of Mexico oil spill is still an ongoing problem. Yeah, and that was in what, 2008? I think so. seven. It, it's been a long time. So, in other words, you, you do have to do this, uh, these comparisons and just recognize that no, no solution is going to be perfect. Now, just so that you don't think that we're, we're trying to do a plug for nuclear here, um, for one, uh, I'm, I don't believe that nuclear is perfect. But I'm not looking for a perfect solution. I think that one day we will have to get away from even nuclear because it does have, uh, you know, it does ha it does have an ecological impact. We have to deal with the uh, the nuclear waste, which I think we're storing in a bunker right now. Uh, yeah. So we I'll get into that a little bit, but basically big concrete casks to keep them in. And the half life of these fuels are, is is really long, so you have to deal with them for long periods of time. So it'll quickly build up and be a maintenance problem, uh, not unlike actual nukes uh, that we have now. Yeah, absolutely. So, so a couple of quick numbers for you. Um, so as far as like actual exposure, so I read a research article. I'll see if I can get a link to it. Um, the university has a license to view it. So if I can't, I won't for copyright reasons. Um, the research was talking about... Um, you know, the, the actual exposure of the workers in the reactors uh, of moving the spent fuel rods out of the reactors into transportation casks that then get moved to um, either a, a slightly distanced uh, on-site storage facility or some other off-site storage facility. Um, and so, for reference, about um, 100 millisieverts or uh, MSV per year is the lowest recorded threshold for radiation exposure uh, for for increased cancer risk. So that's not necessarily like the safety margin. Like we should always be trying to avoid not going over that. Of course, you know we don't want people to just spontaneously get cancer from working in these places. <laughs> but if we can keep it to you know, I think the the actual regulation limit is 35 millisieverts per per five years for reactor workers. Mm -hmm. So to put it in perspective, the fuel rods last about six years actually in the reactor. So if you exchange all of your fuel rods in one go, that's happening every six years. So there's that. So each fuel rod that gets taken out of the reactor is either um, wet dispersed or hot dry dispersed of um, excess neutron energy and then put in casks to then get transported and stored. The total process, if one person was actually to go through every step of that, being right there and participating in it, is somewhere in the neighborhood of four to five millisieverts. Wow, it's per... a lot lower than I thought it would be. Yeah, so, and that's per per fuel rod of course there's you know several fuel rods in the entire reactor and it's you know kind of absurd to think that one person is going to undo literally every single one of these right. in the reactor you know it's going to be spread out over a couple of people but you know the idea that it's this really hazardous thing for the people that work in them is really easily dispelled by this that's not that's not a ton of radiation to be exposed to and it's certainly well below uh the limit even if you figure you know, one person doing a couple of these, they'd still be able to do, you know, uh, call it six fuel rods mm -hmm. safely. Um, and that's that's just within the regulation. That's not even to say that it's going to cause any actual physical harmful effects. Um, so um, just for uh, edification, the current model that we use for nuclear radiation damage is uh, the linear no threshold model, which holds that any amount of radiation will cause some damage to your bio to your biology, and that this is a linear scale. So, getting hit with ten millisieverts is equivalent to getting hit with two doses of five millisieverts. There is some research that suggests that this isn't an adequate way of looking at it, that actually low doses over long periods of time don't have as big of an impact as high doses over short periods of time. And part of the evidence for this is acute radiation sickness, where you won't get rad sickness if you get 100 millisieverts over a year, but if you get it in one dose, you will get sick. 
Um, and also that there's a latent radiation in the environment that doesn't seem to cause uh, advances in cancer when those, there's difference, uh, different background radiation in, say, like Colorado versus Maine. Right. I mean, so, so it's, uh, well, the clouds have gone away. It stopped raining finally. Um, and so the sun is out. So we're getting cooked with radiation right now. And so, you know, we have an ozone and that helps. Um, <laughs> now that we've stopped using CFCs, it helps even more. Um, but, and that's, that's correct. So to not, the exposure is really interesting to look at. So, um, there was a case where, um, you know, occasionally you'll have to, some, uh, reactor worker will have to dive into the water tank, the, the fuel rod tank, basically, um, where the spent rods are kept until they're taken off site, if that's where they go, or stay on site in some other dry cask. So they dive into this tank, and the guy finds some piece of tubing. Uh, he doesn't know what it is, and so they say, okay, well, you know, basically just put it in your toolbox, which is, of course, lined so that any radioactive materials uh, stay away from your person. So, um, you know, he takes that and, well, it turns out that the, the tubing was actually a, a piece of the inner reactor mechanism that was a safety shield. Mm -hmm. So it was massively irradiated. Um, the guy got um, pretty serious burns on his hand. Um, and some on his leg where he was holding the toolbox, but that was it. So he dove into the pool where the fuel is kept uh, and, and didn't have any long-term effects other than holding this radioactive piece of tubing that shouldn't have been there in the first place because, mm -hmm. you know, whatever happened to that. Um, and you, so aside from some, you know, skin rad poisoning that was it um he didn't suffer any long-term effects from that um and so you know the the danger even of keeping them in water is fairly fairly low right so clearly the risk factors in nuclear have been vastly overstated or at least depending on your perspective at least slightly but there is an interesting way in which this works um unlike other energy sources, we were immediately keen on the dangers that nuclear posed. And we had proactive legislation and regulation that covered the, that energy sector, which part may be part of why it's so much safer. If you look at other energy sectors, um, it, we had a reactive approach. Um, and actually part of this, interestingly, Trump had made a claim uh, this year that our air is as clean as it has been in like the last four years, which is incidentally true. Yeah, for once. He, he, he said one thing right, which, so, so nice. The, in the 1970s, we had, a, we had a piece of legislation called the Clean Air Act, which basically regulated e emissions, especially in, I think, cities. I don't know the exact nature of the act, but since then, our air quality has been getting uh, much better, and it's now at standards. Um, which does show us that with some legislation, we can actually have an impact on these industries. And so part of this might actually be the, uh, the social and political aspects of, that surround these energy sectors. And nuclear seems poised for uh, this safety. Yeah, absolutely. And it's, it's interesting, too, that we've had, we have a proactive rather than reactive approach to nuclear, haha, <laughs> reactive. Um, yeah. Um, and it, so just to really quickly touch on that uh, clear air, Clean Air Act bit, um, the, the actual metrics that the EPA had, and I'll link that to, um, something like the, the, the aggregated six top uh, polluters, which was um, sulfur dioxide, um, NOx gases, um, fine particulates, so like uh, 10 microns, and aerial lead, um, so lead binded in various things, and also ozone. So the low atmosphere ozone that's poisonous to people, not the upper atmosphere ozone that lightning makes, that's really good for us because we won't, we won't get as sunburned. Um, though I don't escape that anyway. <laughs> um, so, the all, so it was a combination of those things. Those 
those emissions fell from 1970 until 2017, 2016, when the study was actually published by the EPA, fell 73% as an aggregated total. Um, that being said, if you look at the, the graphic too, it shows that the CO2 emissions did rise some. They rose, I think, 10 to 15%, if I'm reading the graph right. Um, but you know, credit where it's due, that's still pretty impressive. I mean, right. you know, we went from, you know, the turn of the century, well, turn of the 20th century, when farmers were using lead arsenate as uh, crop dust to, you know, as an insecticide. It's like lead arsenate. Everybody tells you that lead and arsenic are bad, and they're right. It, it They are bad, um, at least for, you know, consumption and exposure. Uh, but, you know, we went from that, and now we're actually on a fairly positive air quality trend. I mean, CO2 is bad, um, but certainly, you know, NOx gases, which is smog, um, you know, sulfur dioxide, which of course makes, um, you know, you get a lot of um, bisulfite salts falling that create acid rain, um, even worse than CO2 does. You get all of these things and they're going down, which so, you know, I'm not necessarily, you know, yay, let's go this current administration <laughs> because I do have my issues with it. Um, but we, we have done something right. So that's good. I'm, yeah. You know, credit where it's due, like well, I said. Although com compared to leaving the Paris Agreement, I mean. Well, okay. So we don't do everything right. I did. I said we did <laughs> <Yeah>. some <laughs> things right. Um, though I, I do have some, some particular reservations about uh, global agreements that we can get into after the fact. Well, actually, um, there is uh, one of Simon, Simon Canney's objections to the polluter pay model to go back to that was the sovereignty of nations, actually. This is one of the reasons why he doesn't believe the collectivist position is a good one, because uh, you would be, according to most theories of justice, infringing on the sovereignty of peoples. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and so to kind of see that from from a, a little bit of a different angle in psychology there's like the 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 collective responsibility of one thing ends up dispersed over the number of people present so the example that gets commonly used um or at least was used there was a psychology professor that did a that had a little online lecture about it so uh she was talking about how she went into her class and it was a class of, I think, 100 or 150 people, and it was like a 100-level like a class in college, um, had uh, toilet paper on her shoe, and I want to say also maybe coming off of her trousers. Just... Oh, so, I remember you yeah, that. yeah, so um, basically the, the point she was trying to get at was like she noticed that everybody looked at that and was kind of cockeyed there in the face for a second, like, uh, did she not notice that? But what she noted was that year after year, uh, people didn't really say anything about it. So there was a, you know, it sparked some thought about, well, okay, so if you were one-on-one -on -one with this person, you might say something. But when people get into a group, and I've done this myself in, you know, some situations where, you know, you're in a group of 100 people and you say, well, somebody else will say something. And if all 100 people think that one of the other 99 people are going to say something about it, nobody says anything about it. So I think that can sometimes play into this where you have a whole group of nations and, you know, the UN just says, okay, X needs to be accomplished. And you know, nations will either try to excuse themselves of responsibility somehow or just say, well, you know, it's the UN. I don't really have, I, I participate, but I don't have to listen to them. Somebody else will do it. Um, and I think, I think the U.S. might be, I don't think we're at fault for saying somebody else will do it. I think we just said we're not going to do it, which it's is a problem. It's a well-known problem called the tragedy of the commons. <laughs> uh, we don't have the, the whole breadth to go over the problem, um, but it's well worth looking into because that, this is a perfect example of that. Yeah, and uh, people, that, people that oppose socialism like to use that example a lot. Um, it, it has its... It has its um, it has its place. Certainly, it's not a bad example of 
how collective responsibility works, um, though some of the objections are less in, less informed than others, let's say. Mm -hmm. um, let's see, where are we? So, this actually gets us into our second to last question now. So we've talked about other energy sources, uh, different ethical frameworks, and even you know different agreements that we've made. Um, and all of this has been focusing on our energy sources and our emissions, but uh, you had mentioned socialism. Is it, is it sufficient to just focus on the emissions and the use of energy, but, and not focus on the ways in which we're, we produce the demand for energy? Right. Yeah, so how would I, how would I approach this? So I would say that we have we have the right approach to some level of addressing emissions because they are a very concrete issue that we have some really concrete control over um so by you know choosing to burn oil and natural gas instead of coal that increased air quality substantially it still produces co2 and you know we understand that that's bad long term um, but we made a huge improvement in air quality overall, and certainly, you know, creating cars that can use partly ethanol, um, and, you know, there was uh, corn oil and corn diesel and biodiesel and stuff like that that was uh, kicking around uh, quite a few years ago. I remember uh, in, I think it was middle school or high school, learning about McDiesel, that uh, <laughs> McDonald's was trying to fuel their 18-wheelers uh, and stuff like that that they owned with the f leftover fry oil from their fryers. Um, how they would get that, I don't know, because they never turn them off, it seems like. Uh, <laughs> or it doesn't seem like it. But So that approach to, to, to energy is okay. So we, we do want to focus on emissions because they're a tangible thing. I think the thing that gets pe some people into trouble is trying to trying to just say we need to limit consumption we need to limit or energy production we need to limit it somehow um i i don't think that that's necessarily the right way to go um because it puts undue stress on individuals to consume less and of course that has amplifying repercussions to people who are in lower income situations right um, Michael Schellenberg and his, or Mike Schellenberger, there we go, uh, mentioned in his talk about um, the people in Great Britain that were dealing with um, lack of access to heating uh, because the cost of energy had gone up so much uh, with the, you know, carbon taxation and, you know, trying to get to renewables and things like that, energy costs went up, and so more and more... You know, elderly and low-income people are not being able to heat their homes or flats or whatever and are potentially dying as a result. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think we have to be careful when we make blanket uh, collectivist sort of claims or statements or however you want to say it that we need to consume less yeah. or uh, we need to uh, produce less or anything like that. I think we have to be careful because there is a not very small group of people who are going to be seriously detrimented by that. I agree. Um, I don't think it's as simple as just saying we need to reduce consumption, although I think that there are powerful arguments for some of this, uh, particularly, um, so I might offend some of your sensibilities, but uh, there, this has uh, been used as a counter argument against capitalism, actually, because a lot of people think that uh, markets, especially capitalist markets, are because they're only incentivized to produce profits. They don't have to deal with the externalities of their market actions. So, and uh, just for other people, um, externalities are the after effects of producing a product. They can be good or bad, and they're not part of the cost. So a good way of thinking about this is you're in a library and you buy a bag of chips. You're eating the chips in the library. Now, you only paid like $2 for that. Um, but as you're eating the chips, you're causing distraction to everyone around you. Let's suppose you eat the bag of chips for half an hour and there are three people who are doing work and their work is valued at, you know, let's say minimum wage. 
each of those for half an hour minimum wage let's say it's ten dollars that's five dollars per person so the externality of that is fifteen dollars worth of productivity cost um, that by the way wasn't consumed in the price you only paid two dollars not seventeen dollars so that fifteen dollars is something that's levied onto the uh, onto the market itself onto other people and potentially the state um, in a way right now we there this is part of the idea behind carbon taxation is that well there's this externality that we're incapable of dealing with so how do we make the market take that into account and this is partly how we reduce consumption yeah absolutely um and carbon taxation is a great example of something that you can use really positively without um without getting heavy-handed so you have to be careful and you know i think capitalism has done some good things i think it also does some bad things but you know for it, for another time yeah I, again i i will yeah i'll restrain myself a little bit on the on the issues so i think it's important to recognize that carbon taxation is something that you can impose on the market without the market just completely rejecting it so the the, the capitalist market really doesn't doesn't always play nicely with strong external f pushes and things like that so when you try to change the market really strongly from outside of it, the market rejects it. Um, it avoids it at every cost. That's why there are tax loopholes. That's why there's outsourcing. Mm -hmm. That's why, you know, Burger King buys Tim Hortons and moves to Canada to avoid our taxes here in the States. Um, look it up. I'm not going to link it. Uh, <laughs> so it's, they're really great examples of things that really seriously affect the market from from outside they're not they're trying to impose something on it that wasn't there naturally so carbon taxation is actually something that you can impose on the market that has the potential if it's implemented correctly of rather than just somehow finding a loophole actually innovating energy consumption so that they pay less in energy consumption tax exactly right because the only, the way in which you avoid paying the tax is by emitting less carbon. It's just making it so that the market has to pay for that externality. Right, and I agree. Like that's a it's a good thing to do. So it's partly an accountability issue. So like we were talking about at the beginning, where you we have to draw responsibilities. It's an accountability thing. So if you're actually able to assign accountability to these groups, that's great. Um, you know they're obviously contributing to an issue and they're finding some way of both compensating the monetary compensation for an environmental issue seems uh how do, how do i say it politely um insufficient it, well insufficient certainly but i think it's uh it's sort of virtue signaling in some in some capacity in this case though it might be important to do that well so, yeah, I mean, virtue signaling is bad, but uh, certainly ha having some kind of uh, restraint on somebody like, hey, capitalist, you really like money, well, we're going to threaten to take some of it away from you if you don't cooperate. Um, uh, you can call it coercion if you want to, but I think it's um, strategic market reshaping because that's exactly what the market does. It coerces itself in some ways into changing right that's exactly what supply and demand is right so we'll close off here uh, we've said a lot of things so my last question is where do we go from here where do we go um well i like nuclear a lot so i think that in the short term until we can get other other non-carbon producing or carbon neutral energy forms well underway to desirable efficiency not even just like matching but like desirable efficiency so we're not you know chucking you know hazardous chemicals from solar panels into third world countries for recycle recycling um coming up with something that can you know be an energy dense really usable standby until we get to where we can be less carbon dependent. 
Yeah, I agree. I think uh, nuclear in the short term, for sure, especially because it actually promises to produce the amount of energy we need to consume. And like, if we don't get ahead of this in the next 10 years, we may very well die from it. Um, but I think, as I've said, in the future, we're probably going to need to get away from nuclear itself, too, because that has some ecological consequences. But what I think needs to happen really is just a paradigm shift. Um, we need to be constantly looking for uh, efficiency because we want to minimize our negative ecological impact, negative externalities of our uh, market actions. And so one day nuclear might become a problem and we'll have to deal with that too. But as if nuclear has shown us anything, we need to be proactive about this sort of thing. Absolutely. Um, and, you know, our reservations for um, Bjorn Lomberg aside, um, his idea of, you know, like we said, not constraining the market away from carbon necessarily, but just, you know, kind of nudging it in an innovative direction could be huge. Mm -hmm. um, you know, up until we get to a point where we can, you know, use carbon sensibly in a way to produce other things that produce renewable energy. Um, and there's been some argument too about, you know, jacking up consumption in the short term to get people in you know impoverished countries to a place where they're not so impoverished so that you know you can develop the, the sort of mindscape of of that group of people mm -hmm. so that people are more conscientious about the climate um, people want to invest their c mental capacity and you know whatever they can in their monetary capacity and actually doing something about it and it also turns out that uh, education of women and a better financial status for women does reduce birth rates which incidentally will reduce emissions yeah i mean there's my antinatalist plug oh well <laughs> I, I i i knew it was coming i just was uh, i was waiting to see how it was going to happen so uh yeah and so I that does there's a noticeable uh, trend in that direction for people who are more monetarily uh, situated uh, or better monetarily situated that they they produce less children, um, which mm -hmm. is why there are so many uh, I would say German pseudo nationalists uh, crying about you know native German population is going to be gone. <laughs> Which is why the government has uh, has subsidized having children. So basically, you have more than one kid, and you're going to get a giant tax break. And every child after that has a uh, has an exponential increase in that tax break. Yeah, that's a that's a whole other bag of memes. Uh, yeah, I, I mean that in the literal sense, not like in the in the funny sense, as in like actual memes. Yeah, no, it's it definitely. I don't. Mm, I I do have some deep seated concerns about uh, government regulating. Um, procreation well uh seems like seems like we got through most of what we wanted to get through any any closing comments james well so so we've talked a little bit about where we should go in the future as far as energy and as far as renewables but where do we go in the future of sapientia like what help us help us please uh we need new topics yeah absolutely uh, our topics want to be chosen from our viewers and our patrons so uh, feel free to leave a comment about topics you'd like us to cover. Uh, be sure to like and subscribe as well. Oh yeah, no, we've got uh, we've got our Patreon, we've got Facebook, we've got uh, we've got the other podcasting site, Anchor FM. Yeah, that's the one. Um, it, we'll link we'll link all of those things underneath. Um, we this isn't like I said, it's not sponsored by Death Wish Coffee, so you don't have to worry about it. Though we uh, highly recommend it. Oh yeah, no, thumbs up for them. It's great coffee. Um, so, you know, thanks everybody for, for tuning in, checking us out, and, uh, we hope to see you again in the future. And if you have any criticisms of what we've said here, we'd love to hear your arguments. Yeah. Like seriously, post our podcast, uh, post the, the link for this in the, uh, in the subreddit, uh, roast me. I want, I want to see it like, no, seriously.